My name is Vanessa. I'm 20, 21 this year. I grew up in Perth. I had a normal childhood, I guess. I was born blind. I had optic atrophy, which means I only have 20% vision in my eyes. I was born hearing and I became deaf when I was seven. I'm Ben, I'm 18 years old, uh, turning 19 in June. Uh, I knew I was a trans man since I was 15 years old. My childhood consisted of me doing what I thought was normal and people coming up to me and saying a sentence that was, you're not doing this right. <laughs> That's abnormal. And I had to think about it. And it really, I really think throughout all the years of that developed my anxiety. I'm Kalydra, I'm 14 turning 15. In like the later years of primary school and uh, my first year of high school, uh, I had some um, tall poppy syndrome. So uh, kids made fun of me because I got the uh, best grades and because I tried in class. And I just let what the uh, what peers said, um, their negative comments affect and control me. Um, and it was an unpleasant experience to say the least. My name's Lily, I am 20 years old. I grew up in the care of the Department for Child Protection from the age of six until I turned 18. Some of my experiences would be homelessness, mental health. I struggled with feeling like I belonged somewhere, didn't feel like I had a home, didn't feel like I had a family. My name's Philip and I'm 20 years old. I was born deaf from my dad my dad was the dad when he grew up and when we little we can't live with our parents and we don't move up to our dream and dream pop that look after. Uh, my name is Tamika. At the age of 14 my mum um, took her life um, and then within that same week my dad went back to jail so it was um, me and my brother just living together. Um, he was 16 at the time. So we were both going to school and working to try and pay off a mortgage. I'm Kelly, I'm 26. Um, in hindsight, now see that there were things that were also missing in my life. Um, until I was maybe 14, felt like I had to be there for my parents instead of my parents being there for me. Um, having that lack of um, healthy attachment led to some significant mental health issues for me. My name is Shantae. I'm in year 10. I'm 15 years of age from Swansea Senior High School and I grew up in Perth. Um, my childhood growing up was a little bit chaotic, I'm not going to lie. My biggest challenge um, is probably my mother passed away when I was five and my dad living in a nursing home um, for nearly my whole life. And it's just hard not having your parents there for moral support. It was my older sister in the end that um, she said, tomorrow you're going to a doctor and then you're going to a shrink and you're going to get anti-anxiety and depression. And she saved my life. My whole family saved my life, really, my mum as well. Um, my mum and my nan have really been um, the rocks of my life and they've always stuck like glue and stuck everyone together. And it's Without them, I don't think I would have uh, gotten as far without their encouragement and their support. Uh, my grandma. Yeah. Uh, she's very nice and she was helping us out. And I was learning sign, then I had a sign that, yeah. Yeah. 
The people who supported me most through the challenging times was probably my family. My role model would probably be my nan because my nan is really strong and you know she's gotten through the toughest times and she's always been there for me even though how tough it got, she's always there for me. I was linked in with a youth worker who really made me believe in myself, in who I was as a person and showed me that like I could be what I wanted. I wasn't this kid in care, I was just Lily. Um, and she's been in my life for what, four years now and it's the closest attachment that I've ever had to having a parental figure or a mother-daughter relationship where I could just be open completely with her about anything and she wouldn't push me or tell me what I was doing was wrong. She'd let me come to that consensus myself. The teacher who was in charge of that position um, really let me be creative in ways that like, I definitely wouldn't be now, but were important for me at the time, um, which was really helpful for me to have kind of that freedom of expression still within structure. Um, to have someone I could talk to about the things I was doing um, who supported me and guided me at the same time um, but still gave me that kind of freedom that you really want as a young person. It just makes you feel like you're not alone. And I think that's really important when you're struggling with this and your family's against it or they don't understand and you're maybe having a bit of tough time with your doctors, you can just come to a, a bunch of people who are going through the same thing you've gone through and um, they're just like, yeah, I know that sucks, right? <laughs> I fell pregnant at the age of 17. I was really lucky to work where I did because we ran the Eyes Wide Open program, which is for young mums. Um, so that was my support as well. I wasn't just there working like I was actually there being supported by all the other young mums as well. It's just like a safe environment for people just to let go, not to feel judged, to get out the house for the day, do lots of fun stuff and learn as well. I think as long as people have the right support, the right network, they can really do whatever they want in the future. The first person I came out to him was my psychologist. Actually, I think she, she began <laughs> me questioning all this. So I came back to her a week later, two weeks later, and I said, so it turns out I'm a boy. <laughs> and she was like, um, that's great. Um, but I don't have the qualifications to treat you for that. I know she was just doing her job, you know, but I just felt like a freak because there was no one that I could ask help for. I just feel like sometimes you face, you, you, you place so much trust at the hands of health professionals. And when they look at you dumbfounded, it's like your world tips over. Through high school, that was a really bad experience for me. I was very isolated. My school did not provide interpreters every day for me. They did not give me the correct support that I needed. So sometimes I would go to school and there was no interpreter, so I'd just go home because I didn't want to be there if I wasn't going to have access. For me, a person with a disability, it was a terrible discriminatory experience for me. Although I had teachers who supported me as me, I definitely didn't have people who were able to pick up what was going on at home. Um, yeah, I, like I imagine that if I did, I may have been able to form a healthy, secure attachment elsewhere and maybe not have progressed into a full-blown personality disorder. I think we need more education for the teachers and the principals and the EAs and all the staff 
more PDs, more training, more workshops and hands-on workshops about disability just to make sure that the people with disability enjoy school and not hate it, not have a bad experience. I think for me, the most important thing is for people to have an open-mindedness, an open attitude and be very positive, not negative against disability. People always underestimate me. They underestimate my ability. It's important to um, get education around this because I think if, if people know more about it and if it becomes just like a boring normal thing, then automatically treatment and um, social stigma and just transitioning itself will be so much easier and there'll be less roadblocking. I told them when you fall deaf or half deaf, it's a hard look for job. But um, when I start working St John, um, I got someone who helped me, like tell the kitchen and all the staff, they, I, when they're working with me, eye contact. Don't walk away while you're talking. I don't understand, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to see teachers educated in the skills around, I mean, mindfulness, like just being aware of yourself and what's around you, but then like emotional regulation, distress tolerance and effective communication. I'm not always like by the books and big words in counselling and you know, like across the desk from each other and like a lot of kids find that really intimidating. Like go take them down the beach and kick a footy or play some basketball or do some yoga, do some stuff that they get into that they can get something from as well instead of like making it so clinical. I believe that people who want to work with young children, they need to be understanding and empathetic um, knowing, and they have to know that not every child is the same so don't treat them like they are the same and they all have different problems. and. You know, don't try to enforce your decisions on them. Let them make up a situation and a decision on their own. I honestly think that every young person should have a point where they have a mentor, where that just takes them out and they don't do anything serious. They just go and have some, and do something fun, something that this young person probably wouldn't have the chance to do, something that a mum or a parent would take out, take their daughter out to do, like, getting your nails done. It's good to feel like you're the most important person as well. There's a lot of policies in schools that I think <laughs> they're having problems with. Um, there's a problem uh, with uniforms. And also bathrooms is a big one. I didn't go to the bathroom um, four years while I was in high school. I didn't, because facing the male, female every day, I couldn't do it everyone can see which one you're choosing. So I didn't go to the bathroom. And I think if they just had in place a bathroom with no icon that just said bathroom. So I think supporting young people when you're working for the department under the, your policies and procedures can be really difficult, but that's when a lot of them stand back and be really, really professional. And it's just, you, I like to know the person I'm working with a little bit. I don't want to know if, like you're married or like your personal life, but I want to know something about you, like your favourite colour, your favourite food, something that makes me think that you're another human being, not just someone behind an office chair. Um, to support uh, Aboriginal children and their families, I think that there should be a more clear focus on our culture because um, and togetherness because um, in Aboriginal culture it's a real big thing that everyone's like together and everyone's a family. And that's our mob. I, I wish that um, the government would send a pamphlet in the mail and that mum would open it and it would be, what is transgender? This is what transgender is. This is how you transition. And I, I wish for it so dearly that every time I had a bad moment I'd think the letter's coming. I 
had opportunities to speak with um, other people at university. And that's where I got to meet with people who are, you know, graduating and becoming doctors or like in pharmacy. And my aspirations and plans for the future is uh, to study medicine to become a doctor. I struggled in my own, like, believe it in myself and to have someone else believe in me was what made me think that I could believe in myself. To not give up on us as people, even when you might think that there's no hope, there's always hope for someone to change. Everybody can change. It's just the choice and it's situational. If people give up hope, why should we have hope in ourselves?